In this session, we're going to learn how to bring a CSV into Blender to use with geometry nodes. So there's going to be a little bit of Python. I know we've not touched on Python on this channel before, but it's fairly straightforward what we're going to be doing. Even I can do it. And ultimately, it's going to open up a whole range of possibilities for you. If you can bring a CSV, which is essentially a spreadsheet, into Blender, then you have access to all sorts of interesting data. And as well as being able to bring them in, you can write them from Blender using a very similar process. So what actually is a CSV file? CSV stands for Comma Separated Values. This is the spreadsheet that we'll be using today. We can see it has a header, price, postcode, lat, lon, latitude and longitude. And under here we have the price, which is a house price for a house sale, the postcode of that house sale, which is like zip code in the US. And then we have the latitude and the longitude. So what I've got is I have a spreadsheet with just shy of, oh, this one's only got 550. I have a longer one here, which has just shy of 20,000. We're going to use both. One's obviously going to take a little bit longer to process. Uh, so I've got the shorter one just for while we're setting up the system. But essentially, we just want to get this information into Blender, and we're going to be storing the price as an integer attribute on the point domain. And we're going to be storing the latitude and the longitude as a vector on the point domain. So we're also going to be writing attributes via Python. So this is going to be super useful. It's such a scalable workflow. You've got like the National Office for Statistics in the UK. You've got other statistics offices all around the world, and they'll be producing data as CSV files that are publicly accessible in public domain. Scientists are doing it as well. There's a lot of stuff. I know Brady Johnson works with CSVs when he's doing his molecular nodes. And we've also got uh, the ability to write CSVs and then read them back in via Python. So you can do loads of stuff inside Blender via Python CSV as an exchange format for your data. So I am in Blender 3.4. We will get onto doing some geometry nodes. We're going to use geometry nodes uh, to help us speed up some of our processing just to make sure that we don't have to get too deep into Python. But generally, everything that we're touching on today is going to be, I don't want to say straightforward, but it's going to be certainly doable. And I'm going to try and walk us through the process nice and slowly. So we're not making an add-on, we're making a script and we will be running it from inside Blender. This means that we don't need to worry about registering things, we don't need operators or buttons or anything like that. We're just writing some Python that we will run. So in Blender, go ahead and click new. And I'm just gonna be calling this my script. And make sure that you have saved your file, but do so inside the same directory that you have your CSV files. So I will be supplying you with this, uh, the one that has 20,000 entries, as well as the one that has 500 entries. Just, it's good to have both just while we're working here. So you can download both of those on the link in the description. Let's come in and start. So we're gonna need three things for our script to work. We're working with Blender, so let's go ahead and import BPY because we need to be able to deal with Blender Python. Let's also import OS. This is going to be what we use when we actually bring in files from outside Blender. Uh, this is going to support us across multiple operating systems. Let's finally import CSV because this is what we're going to need uh, to read a CSV file. Now, when working with Python, if we want to make a comment, which is a, a, some words which don't get computed, we can type hash and then start writing it and everything after the hash is going to be ignored. So let's just actually work out what we're going to do here. We need to make sure the object we're using has the same amount of vertices as we have entries in the CSV. This is what we need to be able to map one entry to each vertex. For example, if I have 500 entries in my CSV file, then I need to have 500 vertices to store each entry for us to be able to do some data visualization. Once we've got the right number of vertices, we then need to make sure that we can store the price onto the points. And this is going to be an integer. And then after this, we're going to be storing the coordinates, which is the lat and long, again, onto the points. So we need to break this down a little bit further than this, actually. So making sure that the object has the same number of vertices as we have entries in the CSV. This predicates a little bit of extra work. What this also means is that 
we have an object. We can set the number of vertices and that we have read the CSV file. And the CSV file needs to be read prior to these steps because I need to know the CSV length before I need to set the number of vertices. So let's put this one to the top. So I'm going to get rid of this longer comment actually, we don't need this one now. So this is our sort of first section and then we're going to be storing it on the second section. Just before we get into our main section of code, we're going to write out some useful functions, helper functions for us. So I want to, if I type def, this is going to define a function. So a function is kind of like a node group. You can put Python inside it. And when you call whatever this is, uh, so in this case, it's going to be get file path. When I write get file path later, it's going to run whatever is inside here. So just think of functions like node groups. If I open brackets now, I'm going to be able to pass something in. Think of this like a socket on your group input. Uh, and what I'm going to pass in is the file name. Uh, when we're defining a function, we need to just finish this line with a colon just to make sure that we are now saying we are inside this bit of code, now this block. I like to write what my functions are doing on the top row. So I'll do six uh, single quotation marks and then inside here, in between the three, I can write get file path. This is less useful in Blender, but if you're using something like VS Code, when you hover over uh, a function later on, you'll get this as a tooltip. Now that we're getting the file path, this is where OS comes in useful. So we're going to be using the OS library. Let's do OS, and we're looking for the path of a file. And I want to know what the directory name of my current file is. So this is, I can either just write in the explicit, like the absolute path, and that would work fine. But what I'm doing is I'm writing a function which is going to find the file path for a named file in the same directory as my blend file. This means that I can swap this out later a little bit easier. So I can use this command, OS path directory name, and then in brackets, let's do underscore underscore file underscore underscore and then close brackets. This section is going to basically refer to the current file. In fact, I could print this if I come down just into the main body here. So I've come back on my tabs. I'm no longer up a level here. I'm at the left hand side. Python is like a tabulated language. So the tab lets you know how far into a like a loop or a function or whatever it is. As long as we're on the left hand side, this is where we want to be right now. So just in the main body of my script, let's write print open brackets. And then I've just copied that OS path directory name file into here. And if I run this, you can see nothing errored, which is good. Let's open our window toggle system console. And I can see that this is what is printed here. So I can see Blender tutorials, CSV data viz, and this is the name of my current file. Now I actually want to go up a level. So this is telling me where my current file actually is, what the current file's name is. I want to manipulate this string. So we're going to do something to this OS path. Um, we're actually going to put it inside another function. So type just at the start of this line, os.path.join open brackets. This is going to allow us to take a file name and then we're going to put a comma and then in double quotation mark and in here put in a double period and then another comma. This basically says go up a level. So I'm not in the current file, I'm in the file above, in the directory above. And then what I can do after another comma is I can type in file underscore name. So file underscore name is what we're plugging into the front of our node group or our function. So if I call it over here, it's just going to reference this file name. So I can just do this, I can close this bracket. And now what this is doing is it's saying what is the current directory, the file, but upper level, so just the current directory, and then add to the end of that, the file name. I want to make sure that this is going out of this function. So we also need to do a return. So let's just call this one file underscore path. So file path equals this function we just made. And then on the next line, same tab, do return. This is going to highlight in red because it's like a known word in Python. And we're going to return the file path. So think of this like a group output socket, the file path is referring to anything called file path inside this function. And it's just plugging this out so that we can use it outside the function. 
So now what I can do is I can come down to my print statement and rather than printing this, I can print get underscore file path, which is the function we've just made. And then in parentheses, we're going to put in two quotation marks, which is going to be for a string and the name of our CSV. So if I come into my database here, the short one here, I'm just going to copy the full name, including .csv like this. And now if I click run, nothing errors. That's good news. Let's have a look at our output. And we can see that we've got houseprices.blend dot dot and then UK September sales dot CSV. So when this actually runs, it's kind of going to go up a step because that's what the dot dot means. If you've ever done any like file linking in Blender, it's going to push this up a level. So now we have a way of getting our CSV file, but we don't actually have a way to read it yet. So let's add another function here for reading CSV. So def to define a function, read underscore CSV, and then in brackets, we're going to need the file path. Well, we've just made that. So let's just type in file underscore path. And this is going to basically take the output socket from this function into the input socket of this function. Again, I want to use a tooltip just to let me know what's going on. Sometimes they're really obvious, but sometimes it's useful just to be able to have a little bit of extra information if you need it. Read CSV data inside that triple quotation. So we're going to need a little bit of, uh, of Python knowledge here. So with open file path, comma, quotation, quotation, and then inside put a lowercase r, close bracket as f colon. So what this line is doing is it's saying open the file path. This little r is read, so to read the file, and we're going to be calling it f. Inside here, we can then say how we're going to read this. So let's call a reader is equal to csv dot reader, and then in brackets f. So csv from the library that we imported up above. Uh, dot reader is a function within that csv library and then the function requires a csv file so we've loaded the file path as read only calling it f and then we're loading that into our csv reader on the next line we're just going to be writing this to some data inside our script so let's call this one data is equal to list reader so we're just making a list of the contents that the csv reader has read out that's essentially what's going on and then just the same, I want to be able to pass this out of this function. So we need a group output node. I mean, we need a return function. And we're going to be outputting data, which is this one. So data. So if I was to print this, uh, we could do in the same one. So this one gets our file path. We can actually put this straight into our read CSV. Read underscore CSV. Open brackets. Put a close bracket at the end. And then let's run this. Okay all looking good. Let's have a look at our, <laughs> our thing. So this is what Blender is reading. Uh, I don't know a good way to show this. We can see we have a house price, we have a postcode, we have a latitude and we have a longitude. So essentially we now have a list from Python, from the CSV reader containing the contents. Each list entry is one row from our, um, from our CSV. So we're getting much closer now we've been able to read the CSV, but we actually need a little bit more information here. So rather than just reading the whole CSV, we need to be able to read specific columns and say, this one is just the column for house prices. This one is just the column for house latitude. So we're also going to do another function called CSV column. So let's define a new function, CSV underscore column and in brackets. So this is, again, this is our group input. We're going to want the data from the CSV file. And we're also going to want to know which column and we're going to do this by integer. So let's just type in col here and we're going to use that later. Finish this line with a colon, enter to go to a new line and then uh, let's give ourselves a tooltip. So I'm going to call this one pass CSV data by index as array and then close my tooltip. So first of all, I want to make an array which is just going to be a list so I can just simply call it array and then give myself an empty square brackets. 
This means that every time we run this function, it's going to basically create an array which is empty, and then we're going to add to it per passing the CSV. On the next row, we want to actually read our CSV and we want to use a numerate. Let me just write this and then we'll explain. <laughs> Probably a bit easier. So let's do for y, comma, row in enumerate data and then a colon. So what this row is saying is for the information in data, but we have enumerated it. So rather than just looping through each row, which we've basically said each element is going to be called a row, but we're also enumerating. We're creating a number per row. We're essentially counting up and giving an index. So in this case, I'm saying y. Y because it's the vertical axis of my spreadsheet. So we're saying for the index y per row in data. And then we can start using this later. So if y is equal to zero, then I'm going to continue. And what this is saying is if I'm on the first row, this is my first entry. Just the row headings. In fact, you can see it easier if I look at the actual spreadsheet here. You can see I've got price postcode lat long. This is not information that I want. So if I'm on row zero, ignore it, just continue. So if we're not on row zero, then what we're going to do is we're going to do array which is this, we want to add the contents of this row. So we need to append to it. That's going to add to the end of our array. And we're interested in adding the row. So if I do this row, then if I was to just leave it as this, what we would be adding would be a full row. But I don't want a full row. I want to add just a single element. So in this case, it's either going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3, as per my columns. So I can just do a square bracket to say uh, I'm going to be declaring some index and the index is going to be col because this is our input. I want to control this from the outside of the function. So all I'm doing is I'm going through my data. We're ignoring the first row. And then for every other row, we're going to be appending from the row some piece of information based on the column. And then after this, we can just return. And I want to return the array. So this is going to be our the contents of this loop is going to output just one column from that spreadsheet. All right. I always like to separate my functions from the rest of my code. So I'm just going to put in a little block of equals here. There we go. Just to make that a visual difference. And now we can actually start building our, our system here. So I'm going to get rid of this print statement. First of all, I want to know what my file name is going to be. Uh, and I like to just make some declarations at the top of my script, just to make this a little bit easier. So the first one we're going to be doing is calling the name of this. I can have a look in my folder. So that was this UK sales CSV. And I can put that here. And in fact, just for now, I'm going to actually add the second one as well. So if I just do this, this time I'm going to comment this one out though. So comment out file underscore name. I'm going to give it the same name. It's commented out, which means it won't get computed. But later on, I can just flip them. I can just switch which one is commented out. So in the speech marks, I can put that second one. This is my full list. And this one is my short list. You can do these uh, comments in the same line as well, like I am here. So I've got my file name here. Uh, next thing I want to do is I want to output some data. So Let's do data is equal to, and we're going to use our um, our functions. We're going to use read CSV, read underscore CSV, and then in brackets I need the file path, and the file path is going to be get file path and then the file name. So get file path, and then in brackets I can just write file name because I've already got it in a declared variable. So file name. Make sure you have the right number of parentheses around these things. So this is my data. Next, I want to know what my price is going to be. So we've got our price is equal to CSV underscore column, open brackets, data. This is our CSV. And then I need to know which column I'm looking at. Let's go back to our spreadsheet. I'm looking at column zero for my price, column two and column three for my latitude and longitude. So zero for price, latitude is going to be equal to CSV underscore column open brackets, data two. And the next one is going to be longitude. 
is equal to csv underscore column open brackets data again comma three all right so this is the information about our csv we now have it in our script just after the declarations let's just do a quick check let's do a print open brackets price close brackets and let's just run this script all right so i can now see that this is just printed out only the prices and if i was to run this again with longitude or latitude let's run this and this has just given us the longitude all right no errors so far this is going well the next thing we need to do is so we've read the csv let's uh, put this up to the top Control shift up and then the next step is we have an object so i'm actually just going to add an object at this point so shift a plane and this has given me a, just a plane object and i can come down here and i can find the plane now rather than doing this like adding the object in the script we're going to make it easier on us i'm just going to make it so it's going to use whichever object we have active in here let's just type in obj because we want to just be able to declare this later as like a a thing that we can use so make our lives easy obj is equal to bpy.context.active underscore object so literally just the object that is active so the current context inside blender the active object now we need to set the number of vertices and this is actually something i'm going to use geometry nodes for because it just saves us from getting too deep into python and needing to create vertices manually so let's just create a geometry nodes editor i'm going to add a new geometry nodes tree let me full screen this i'm just going to add a point points node and rather than points we need vertices specifically so let's also do a point points to vertices node and i'll just plug this into the group output plug this count into the group input and that's everything let's call this node tree make underscore vertices so we just have an object that is just making points converting them to vertices and connecting them to the group output so let's automate this a bit more <laughs> let's take our object and let's make it automatic the step of adding the geometry nodes modifier because this is it's just a useful skill to know so let's go ahead in here i'm going to need to uh, basically just say object which is our current object that we have selected uh, dot modifiers and then after this i can do new open brackets and then in quotation marks i can call this something so i'm going to call this one make underscore vertices so this is just the actual name that you find at the top of the modifier the type of modifier well let's actually have a look at how we can find this because searching through blender is <laughs> it's not always easy so if i have my let's get rid of that modifier so i've got an object i have it selected in the console on the left hand side of blender i can do basically the same code so obj is equal to bpy dot i can do t i can do c and then tab for context and then in here if you press tab it's going to give you all of the options so context if i do up in active and then object and we can complete that so obj now doesn't return this it returns what that would have returned so obj is now attached to the actual object data if i come in here and i do obj dot and then press tab we get all of the options for the object data one of these being modifiers one of the answers for that being new and then this is going to tell us what it wants it wants the name and it wants the type if i just close the brackets it's going to say no i, I required some parameters so let's try and just add a name here let's do test and i hit return and it says oh well the type wasn't provided so let's do a comma and then again let's do quotation marks and let's just try typing in geometry nodes and then this is going to actually give you some solutions so geometry nodes it said it couldn't find the type geometry nodes was not found in this list of options so if we go through here we won't find geometry nodes what we're going to find is just nodes so this is important when we do this let's press up again rather than geometry nodes this one has to be capital n-o-d-e-s and now when i return you can see that we've added an empty geometry nodes modifier 
All right, so back in our script, let's make sure that we're saying quotation, quotation, nodes in capital, and then close the brackets. Now we need to do another step actually, because we need to set the make vertices on here. And actually just before we move on, let's make sure that we've marked this with a fake user, just to make sure that it doesn't get deleted if it's ever not on something. So to actually apply a node group to your geometry nodes modifier, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have stored what the geometry nodes modifier is like we need a reference to it. If we just declare this, it will get added, but we won't have a handle on it during our like compute during our code. So let's make sure that we've got something here. Let's just do geo nodes is equal to this. So we're going to create it, but we're also going to give it a name. And then in the next line, we can just go geo nodes dot node group. And then this is going to be equal to some node group in our console. Let's just have a little search for this. Let's make sure we can find the right Python. So BPY dot data, because we're looking for a data block, basically press tab and we can have a look in here. So if I scroll up, I can see that node groups is an option. So let's just type this node groups. And if I do full stop again, then we can try just typing values and see what's available. So values open and close. And we can see that there is a node group. And then this is basically, this is the name basically. So I can just copy this and I can put it in here. So there we go. If I close this and I have this object selected, make sure you save before you run a script. And then if I run it, you can see that I now have added a geometry nodes modifier called make vertices. I have a node group called make vertices, which I have applied to the modifier and I have a count for the number of vertices that we want. All right. It's all coming together. I'm going to switch this now from the node editor to the spreadsheet editor. This is going to be useful. So let's go back. Now we want to set the number of vertices. So the number of vertices needs to match the length of our data set. If I just run this up as far as we are, we have one vertex. I want to make sure that this count is higher. We can just right click on here and copy full data path. If I just paste this into my script, we can see that we have object uh, plane and then make vertices and then input. So this is the full data path to this specific entry. But what happens if we're using a different object at some point in the future? Well, this first section is going to need to change and vary based on our script. And what happens if we're using a different modifier or we can't find something that's got that name? Well, then we're only left to this, but we've already made a reference. We have geo nodes as the reference to this specific modifier. So now we can just do geometry nodes input two, which if we hover over this with developer extras and tooltips turned on, we can see that we have input two on there. All we need to do is make this equal something. So if I said equals 10, and I uh, run the script, you can see the second one has 10 as its option. So rather than 10, what we're going to do is we're going to look for the length L E N open and close brackets. And then inside here, I can find price. So basically the length of price, I could have done latitude or longitude price was shorter. So if I save and I run this script, we can now see that we have 555 vertices. All right, this is going well. Next thing I want to do is actually just apply this. I need these vertices to be real. So there's different ways of doing an apply modifier. The easy one for us in this situation is just going to be to apply this modifier uh, with ops. So let's go ahead and let's just type this as a, as a note to ourselves, apply modifier with a hash. And then I'm going to be doing a bpy.ops.object because we're applying something to the object. It's an object operator. Modifier underscore apply. That's literally what we're doing. And then we just need to say what the name of the modifier is. So modifier equals. And then in here I could write make vertices. But if I run this again, let me just comment that line out. So if I run it twice, this second one is actually called make vertices 001. So rather than doing this based on an explicit name, let's use the name of geometry nodes that we just made. So we have this reference geo nodes that we have, and then we can just do full stop name. So this is geometry nodes. What is your name? That's going to be returned in here. So it doesn't matter how many modifiers we have and really what the name is going to be. All it's going to do is it's going to say whichever one I just made, I'm going to apply. So let's just remove both of these, save, 
and then let's run this. So one thing that you might run into with making geometry nodes and then immediately applying it with Python is that it hasn't actually had time to update the dependency graph. So you've applied it, but it's got a bit confused and it hasn't actually updated the mesh data. So something that might be useful is to just have a way to update the dependency graph. Let's just make a quick function for this. It's very simple. Def trigger update open and close brackets. We don't need to pass anything into this. We're just going to be telling it to basically update Blender. A really easy way for us to do this is simply going to be bpy.ops.object.modeset. So take the active object and set the mode, which is essentially going to be changing the mode between something in here. And we can just change this one to mode equals quotation, quotation, edit in block capitals. So this is going to set it to edit mode. And then I'm going to just copy this and I'm going to change it from edit to object. So we've gone to edit mode and then we've gone back into object mode. And this, depending on your speed of your computer, depending on how Blender's running, sometimes like what else Blender is needing to do or how complicated your geometry nodes graph is, it can be useful. Just if you need to apply geometry nodes and then actually apply the modifier, make it real, like destructive. It's good to just have a trigger update function just that you can run basically to make sure that the dependency graph has been updated. Continuing on, we now have actual vertices. So if I, if I run this, we end up in this situation where we have all of our points. So store the prices onto the points as an integer. What do we need to do in this case? Well, we need to create a new attribute and we then need to uh, write the price, like the CSV data, into that attribute. So what we need is another function. This is just going to make our lives a bit easier. So let's create a new function up here, def to define. Let's uh, add a new attribute and inside our brackets, this is stuff that we're going to pass in. We're going to be passing in the object name. So not the object data itself. We want the object name specifically because when we do named attributes, they can be done through this attributes menu, right? So we will just be adding something in here. This is not on the object. This is on the mesh data. So because we only know which object we're working with, we need to find the mesh data associated. And so to find that, I just need the object name. After the comma, we're going to be doing the attribute name. So let's do attr underscore name. So this just lets us pass in a string for the name. And then we're also going to be doing a type because we need to know what type of, uh, what type of attribute you're making, whether this is a float or a vector or a byte color or, you know, whatever it might be. So let's also give this a default, which you can do with variables here. So I can do type by default will equal. So if there's nothing else here, it's going to be a float, capital float. And I'm going to do the same for the domain. So I, I want to be able to change the domain if I want to, but if I don't want to, it's just going to automatically create something on the point domain. So domain equals quotation, quotation. This one is going to be in the point domain. So this is good because it means that if I just call add attribute with the object name and the attribute name, I don't have to do the type or the domain. It's going to automatically fill in defaults if I don't have those defined. Finish this line with a colon, go to the new line, and I need to create a new attribute. And I also want to make sure I've got hold of it. So give it a name. We're just going to go ATTR to begin with. So BPY dot data, we're dealing with the data in Blender and we're dealing with the meshes. So the mesh associated with an object. In this case, I can just type in the object name. So uh, this is what we're passing in here, OBJ underscore name. And then we can do some further um, dealing with attributes, making new attributes. If you're looking for this kind of information, use the console. It's going to be very useful for you. So bpy.data.meshes. It's going to ask you now to define which object you're looking for the mesh of. So this is how I know what sort of information we're looking for. So if I type in P tab, then it's going to fill the plane. Now, if I put another period, then we get to the next section. So I can have a look at what information I can manipulate about this data. 
I can manipulate the vertices. I could change their literal positions myself. What I'm actually going to be looking for here, if I go up to the top, we're looking for an attribute. So yes, we do have the option for attributes. So let's do that. ATT R-I-B-U-T-E-S, plural. So attributes. Now let's have a look at what happens if I do full stop and tab at the end of there. It's going to give me the options available. And I'm specifically looking for making a new attribute. So here is the option for new. So open bracket, and then it's going to say name type domain. So in our script up here, let's make sure that we've got new, open brackets, close brackets. We're going to have, first of all, the name. So this is something we're passing in. So attr underscore name. Uh, we also want the type and the domain. So again, we're passing this in from outside. So we can just type in type and domain. And then after this, simply return the attribute just to make sure it's in your group output to go through out of your function. So back in the main body of our script, we can call our add attribute here. So add underscore attribute, open brackets. This is going to want our object name. So just type in obj.name. This is going to basically give us a shortcut to the name of the object we have selected. The attribute name in this case is going to be price. So we can just type this as a string between quotation marks and the type and the domain we can change as well. So I do want it to be on the point domain, so I'm not going to change that. So I'm going to use the default that we set before. However, in this case, the price is going to be an integer. So if I do quotation, quotation, and let's try typing in integer, and then let's close the brackets. Say, so let's run this script. Okay, so this is thrown an error. Integer is not found in float int, float vector, float color, byte color, string boolean, float two, int eight. So you can see these are all of our options here. So instead of integer, we want int, but also instead of vector, you want float vector. And we're going to use that in a minute. So let's come down. So instead of integer, we're going to just write int. Let's run the script again. And now we can see in our spreadsheet, we have price as an integer on the vertices. Interesting. So we're getting there already. Now I just need to write to this attribute. Right now, I don't actually have a handle on anything that the function has passed out. So let's also just call this one attr equals this function. So now I can refer to this attribute just as being attr later on. And I need it almost immediately because we need to write some data to it. So let's take attr and we're going to use a function called for each set. This is within data. So we have our attribute, we're looking at the data for the attribute, and then we can go for each underscore set, open close brackets. For each set is going to want some information. It's going to want to know what kind of data we're writing and where the data is coming from. So if I was to just go ahead and do value, so this is just a value, a float value we're writing, and we're going to be writing the price. Now if I save this and I run, this is going to say couldn't access the Python sequence. Well, let's actually have a little bit of an investigation into why this is going to be like what's what is in our price sequence that it doesn't like. So let's comment this out because that's what caused the error. And let's just do a print statement. Let's have a look at price. Save and let's run this. OK, so in our console, we can see these are all of our prices. Something that is really important to note is that these prices are bounded by quotation marks. And that means that they're actually strings. So I need to convert each one of these values to an integer. And then I'll be able to use it. So as soon as it becomes a value, we can actually write it. Right now, it doesn't know that it's not a string. Let's create a new array called price sequence, price underscore sequence, uh, and then open close square brackets. Now for i, for index in range of the length of price, so this is going to say loop through for as many times as there are values. So as soon as we want to go into a loop, let's do a colon, the next tab line, we can take our price sequence and dot append because we want to make sure that we're adding something to the end of it. And what we're going to be adding is going to be price, but not just price, we need the current value. So I in price, we're looking for this, this value in the list. And we also need to make sure that we're converting at this point price to an integer. 
So let's do int open brackets around the price i. So this is going to do a conversion for us. So now if I print price underscore sequence. So now if I print, let's have a look. Now we have got just the actual integer values. They've taken off all of our quotation marks. So now, in theory, if I get rid of that print statement and I reveal my for each set statement, and I'm going to change this from price to price underscore sequence. There we go. And then let's run this. Now we can see in our spreadsheet, we didn't get an error. Now we have all of our values on the geometry. We're going to be doing the exact same thing for the coordinates, latitude and longitude, but that one is a little bit more involved just because we're turning two columns, latitude and longitude, into a vector. So I can copy this section, control C. I'm going to put this down to the bottom. This time, rather than price sequence, I'm going to call this one coordinates as my input array. Range uh, is fine again. All of these are the same length. And we're going to be doing the coordinates. Let's change this one. Dot append is going to be int. And instead of price i, we're going to be doing latitude. And I actually want to copy this. So let's do the same on the next row. So with a vector, it doesn't want everything bundled into tuples, it, it literally just wants a sequence of values. So it's going to go x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. It doesn't care that they're all mixed in together. They just need to be in order. There just needs to be a sequence. So we would expect the final length of coordinates to be three times longer than we have rows in our spreadsheet. So we're going to have append int, and this time it's going to be longitude, which is what we made earlier. Longitude i, so the current version as per the loop. And then we also need to do coordinates dot append. We need something for our Z value. We don't care what it is. So I'm just going to put in zero as an integer. So this time, let's get rid of this comment. We need to create a new attribute and it's going to be called coordinates. And it's going to be a float vector. So capital float underscore vector. And then where we want to write the CSV data to that attribute, we're going to say attribute, which we've just declared, data for each set. And instead of value, this time we are writing a vector. And instead of price sequence, we are writing uh, this array that we made before, coordinates. So this time if I run this, uh, okay, so we're actually, we're getting an error here. Invalid literal for int with base 10. 52.49. So when we were making our coordinates append, instead of converting them to integers, this time we want to convert these to floats. So just type float instead of int. There we go. So now converting them from a string to a float value. So now if I run this, you see in our spreadsheet that we now have price as an integer and coordinates as vector. So this is basically it for our script actually. Now what we want to do is we want to add geometry nodes to process this. So let's save. We're going to go into our geometry nodes workspace. We have our object here. Let's create a new geometry nodes tree and let's call this one map. So just something simple. I'm going to call it map. Let's use a geometry set position node. We're going to use an input named attribute node. And let's use from the drop down the coordinates attribute as the position. Now, if I go into my top down view, we can see this is the location, the coordinates of every house sale or 500 of them since September in the United Kingdom. And I can start doing stuff with this information. It's way over to one side. So perhaps we will first of all want to center it. Let's take a bounding box node, so geometry, bounding box. And I want to take the maximum and the minimum. I want to find halfway between it. So we're going to use a mix node. So utility mix vector between A and B. This is going to give us a uh, the halfway vector, which we can then subtract from the position. So if I was to just take a geometry transform node and a vector math scale by minus one, join these up and join these up into our translation. And there we go. This is centered it. So rather than centering our bounding box, let's go ahead and center our actual points. 
just onto the origin here. I want to do something kind of useful with these rather than it just being, you know, useless values. I want to turn this into some kind of mesh. So we have a few options with this being geometry nodes while we have a lot of options. Let's do a couple of fun ones. So first of all, we might want to make balls of different sizes based on the price. So let's instance on points. Let's do an icosphere. And let's increase the subdivisions here. I'm going to turn off my wireframe. Now I can set my scale to be some function of the price. So let's do a named attribute node set to price. If I just plug this into the scale, they're going to be big because these are like hundreds of thousands. So let's also do a map range. Now, in fact, I could normalize this. That might be even better. Let's use an attribute statistic node, plug this from our geometry, plug through our integer, and we can now normalize this with a map range. So utilities map range into the original attribute, min and max, just control H to hide that. And then I can plug this into my scale. So now we can see <laughs> there's a couple of outliers. <laughs> there's some ridiculously expensive houses up here. I think this is probably the Midlands or the Lake District or something. So very expensive property clearly went for sale there. So that outlier is kind of doing a lot of damage. <laughs> so we're just gonna we're just gonna use the map range this time. So let's go maybe from between zero, um, or I suppose a cheap house would be maybe ten thousand. Like that would be a very inexpensive property. And then one in the UK might be, let's say, two million. So we're definitely going to have some which are above that. But there we go. Now we can see where we're starting to get some clustering of properties that are more expensive. Clearly, don't have a full map of the UK here in our um, in our data set, but maybe we'll have more luck when we go to the full data set. So instancing spheres, this is an option to you. Obviously a lot of collisions going on. Let's try something else. We've got all of these points. Let's do like a, a Voronoi based on the points so that we have a face per point. And then we can do like an extrude based on the price. So I want to do a curved circle. And on each of these points, I want to instance on points a curve line with zero length. So a curve line, instance on each one with zero length. So everything's going to disappear. I'm then going to instances, realize instances. I'm going to join it with my curve circle. And then I'm going to fill curve. So this is a little trick that you can use. If I turn back on my wireframe, you can see that every time we had one of these points created by a curve line, we now have a, uh, a sort of triangulation based on that. I just need to make sure that my curve circle is big enough that it's outside the full thing. And you can see that that is there. And then we can do maybe a dual mesh. So let's grab mesh, dual mesh from the top of the list. And there we go. Now we have a face per value. Now I can just delete all of these outer ones by deleting any point which is a boundary point. So shift A, we're going to just grab geometry, delete geometry. We're going to be deleting points where the edge neighbors, where the faces per edge is equal to one. So if you're on the edge of a face, if your edge is only attached to one face, that's a boundary. So I can just do edge neighbors is equal to one. And this is just going to leave me with these internal faces. All right, now let's do an extrusion with a mesh, extrude mesh. And our offset scale is going to be based on the price. And we just need to transfer the price from these original points over here. So let's just run this up. We're going to be pushing this through a sample to transfer. So need to transfer by nearest point, which is going to be geometry, sample index, and geometry sample nearest. Now, because we did all of this stuff with the dual mesh and everything, I can't guarantee that the indices are going to be the same. So I'm just going to do it by nearest instead, just like this. So index into the sample index into here. We're going to be transferring a, an integer, which is going to be our named attribute for the price. 
And then we can plug this into our offset scale over here. These are insanely big because we're dealing with some of them being over a million. So we can just do this with a map range like so. Uh, we're going to clamp up to 2 million as being 0 to 1. There we go. So we can see some insanely high priced houses up here. Surprisingly, not around London, actually. I guess there hasn't been much of a, many house purchases in London recently, or perhaps just not within my data set. So there we go. Awesome. Now, another thing that we might want to do here is actually add this map node tree to the object as the final step in our script. So you can just have an object, any object, and you can tell it which CSV you want it to look at, and it'll just go through everything. So it's completely touchless up to this point. So I'm just going to save this. Let's go back to our scripting workspace, and I'm going to add just to the end down here the same steps as we went through for adding the geometry nodes before. So just copy these files, copy these two lines of code down to the bottom. I've got geometry nodes, object.modifiers.new. This one is going to be map. So we're going to be making the map and it's using the nodes modifier. So this is geometry nodes and the node group that we're going to be using, I can see in my outline here is map lowercase. So I can just do this as well. M A P save this. And in theory, I can delete this object. Let's add a new one. And I should just be able to run the script. And there we go. Now we have our data visualization straight off. Let's swap over to our other, <laughs> to the one that's 20,000 long. So I'm going to just uncomment the first one, comment out the second one. So this is now my 20,000 values in my CSV. Uh, I can actually just run it on the same object, I think. Maybe let's just go back. So let's go ahead and just run this script. It takes a little bit longer. But there we go. Oh, we can see that when we have more values, there's a huge amount more range. I'm surprised that it's not more consistent. We might want to make this a little bit more average. So at some point in the future, there will be a smooth attributes node. For now, we can do a little interpolate domain hack. At this point, we have a bunch of vertices. And if we move forwards, then we can get to our dual mesh. Uh, actually, just before, when we get to the fill curve here. So at this point, I still have all of these vertices in the same locations as they were before, right? However, if we look at our spreadsheet, we don't have these important bits of information. So we need to first of all, just transfer them back uh, in this case, we're only interested in the house, in the house prices. So we can take our samples that we made before and let's just transfer them back to this fill curve output. So shift A, attribute, capture attribute. And we're just going to capture as a float on the points, just like this. Now, what we can do with this information is when you convert something from a point domain to an edge domain, it's going to take an average of each end. And then when you convert that to a point domain, it's going to take an average of every connecting edge. So in this case, we can actually do a, uh, a domain space conversion a couple of times and end up with something that's going to be, you know, a little bit more smoothed out, a bit less rough. So I'm going to capture this on the points, um, but I'm actually going to go via an interpolate domain node. So I'm going to take this attribute, which is on the points, I'm going to interpolate it onto the edge domain. Now I'm going to recapture it onto the points over here. And this should have taken sort of one pass of an average. So it should smooth it out just a little bit. Now this capture attribute can go through the dual mesh and then the delete geometry and the extrude. And I wonder actually if we can use this capture directly, maybe through the map range. All right. So if I, if I mute that, you can see that these come up a little bit higher. So what we can do is we can just step a few more of these interpolate domain nodes next to each other, just to do a little bit more of a sampling nearby average. So we're going to take one for point and one for edge. And let's do this. And we're going to do another, uh, another point here. And then we can just bring these onto a new line. So we're going point into edge. Let's go a few times. Uh, 
and then we can plug this up into our value over here. All right, so now we're getting, uh, getting a little bit more of the general trends. Interesting, so you can see where there's cities really, where you get these real high points, probably Birmingham, probably Manchester up here. London, I'm surprised at the lack of, but it's probably just my data set was incomplete. The, the data set should have had 120,000 entries. I cut it off at filling a 20,000. Now there is going to be a smooth attribute node coming at some point. So later on, it's going to be much easier for us to just use a single smooth rather than needing to do this sort of interpolation. But this does allow us <laughs> to do as much kind of smoothing as we want to do, just to, to take a real average there. All right, it's starting to be a bit more interesting. I really love this kind of data viz. The more points you have as well, the more interesting it becomes. So if you do have a massive data set that you have access to, I recommend just having a play with it really. I could have left this one to compute for longer, but I figured I should stop it at 20,000. Maybe I'll go back and compute the full data set. I'm thinking that this only did England, not Wales and not Scotland, and obviously not Northern Ireland either. I'll just leave it computing over tonight and I'll add the full version to the files if you want it. So interesting. So yeah, this is how we can do data visualization. Oh, we have some negatives. Let's go back and fix that real quick. Let's just, uh, let's take our attribute statistic node at this point. And we can just make sure that we're working with the best values that we have access to. So max and min on here from zero up. So here we are. This is how we can take a CSV file, just a comma separated values file, taking a bunch of data. In this case, we were using the price of house sales since September 2022 against the longitude and the latitude so that we can start doing something interesting like plotting house sales and house prices per region. And you can do some really beautiful work with these as well. I've seen some really cool 3D printed stuff you can throw these into a like a looking glass portrait if you want something 3D on your desk. And yeah, this is just a really fun way of working. And also the cool thing about having a script like this that is fully automated top to bottom is I can just throw in something like a monkey, run the script, and I've got it just immediately. Like I could throw in another uh, spreadsheet. I could just try a different, different data set if I had something available. But these just, they look so cool especially with the sunlight on them like this. Just seeing those peaks and just knowing that that's like, that's house prices. Like we've obviously taken some liberties by doing so much smoothing, right? So in our geometry nodes where we have this massive array of, <laughs> of interpolate domains, this really is not helping the situation in terms of like the legitimacy of the data. But if you're somebody who's, you know, just doing data visualization for social media or you know, just generally getting a sense of it rather than it being like, this is a PhD thesis. So obviously there's a time and a place for taking averages <laughs> over areas for smoothing it out without removing your massive outliers. I mean, I could come in here and I could clamp this. So I could say, right, the price, let's just take the minimum value between, you know, zero and these values and the maximum value um let's say maybe a million like anything over a million is just a very expensive house so at this point okay you know this is actually a little bit fairer i think but there's going to be places potentially in london where you've only really got i don't know a smaller number of houses that are actually less than a million so it's, it depends how you want to play it this looks freaking cool though I'm really happy with it. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've had fun. The CSVs are cool. Go do some Python. I'll catch you in the next one. Mm -hmm.